My name's Rich Banyard. I'm a mechanical design engineer from Retail CSM in Plymouth. Uh, I'm here with Glenn Cherest, a mechanical engineer from Meta. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the, the ORB3 high, high power rack or HBR system. Uh, just a sort of add on, uh, Dimitri Shapiro and, and David Sun both contributed to these slide decks and they're, they're really strong proponents in the, uh, in the work stream. So just want to give them a bit of recognition for their um, additions. So essentially what's, what's driving the need for this, this product is obviously AI. It, it's really kicking off big time um, and power requirements are simply going through the roof. So the, the current ORV3 standard rack uh, only designed really for, to support 18 to 36 kilowatts of power. Um, but obviously AI needs a lot more than that. So this new HPR rack, we're aiming to deliver, deliver in excess of 92 kilowatts of power. Um, and in order to do that, we're, we're increasing the depth, um, not the base rack, but we're adding an extension onto the rear. So approximately six inch extension on the rear. Uh, as I mentioned, the bus bar capacity is going up. The, uh, the PSU, BBU, all the, all the power equipment inside, the capacity is increasing. Glenn will go through that a bit more uh, a bit later on in the slide deck. Um, but additionally, so the blind mate manifold connection at the moment, standard rack, uh, we're, we're expanding the capacity of that. So it's still fit a standard um, manifold in there, but you can get a bit of additional depth out of it with the extension. So this slide here kind of gives a, a representation of what the HPR looks like. So on the right hand side here, the image, uh, the main black part of the rack is obviously the standard OCP ORV3 rack that you can buy off the shelf today. The yellow component up the middle is a representation of a high power bus bar. And the blue is the extension that makes up the HPR or helps support the HPR components. So the extension itself is uh, simply like a, a welded sub-assembly. There's some stiffening features in there, uh, additional features to support the, uh, the deeper buzz bar. Uh, and all of this is simply bolted onto the rear of the rack, the rear of the standard rack. <coughs> We haven't removed the ability to use any of the existing kits. So power shelves are all standard, equipment shelves are all standard. Um, and obviously with the extension at the moment, it consumes the fixing positions on the rear of the rack. In order to get around this, we've, we've replicated that on the rear extension. So you're able to fit rear heat exchangers, doors, bolt down brackets, all of that that, you're, that you would be able to fit on the standard rack, you can fit on a HPR rack. The increased depth as well in the, uh, in the extension, it allows you to fit up to six AC whips, uh, and they'll be all, all be routed through the, through the blue section in the rear. Uh, again, with the increase in power, the whips and the connectors are all getting bigger, or the whips certainly are getting bigger. Um, so this gives you more space, more flexibility to, to apply that. So, while we're able to leverage almost all the standard kits, the, uh, the one or two sort of unique to, to HPR is the bottom of row containment as seen on the left, and top of row containment on the right. Um, so these are obviously used to seal the rack against the hot aisle and the cold aisle. Um, and so yeah, like I say, they're, they're unique to this rack. However, they, they mount in exactly the same positions in the depth as the standard rack. Uh, so that means if we've got a bank of HPRs, standard racks, all mixed, um, there's no loss in, uh, in sealing efficiencies from rack to rack and row to row. Um, and then final, final item on this slide. Uh, you see here on the right-hand side uh, an example of cooling manifolds being fitted into the rack. These mount in the same position, again, as a standard rack. Uh, but as mentioned, with the increase in depth, you've got the extra six inches, meaning we can fit uh, a higher volume uh, manifold or change your connection type to come out rearwards rather than sidewards. Um, so really giving you a lot more flexibility again um, in these kind of deployments. 
So this image here gives us a, a bottom-up view of the rack um, with the extension on the left-hand side and obviously the base rack on the right. Uh, one of the challenges that we faced with adding all the, the additional weight of the, the manifold, oh, sorry, the, the buzz bar and the extension is particularly in empty racks, it kind of makes the rack a lot more susceptible to, to tilting rearwards. So handling becomes challenging uh, and, and a lot less safe. So in order to, to combat that, you can see these orange plates. Um, these are the ballast kits. So the aim is to obviously bring the center of mass further forward, lower down, um, and then that will prevent any kind of risks or reduce, certainly reduce risks and allows you to pass the, the additional testing, the qualification, UL qualification that's required um, to, be, to be selling these racks. So also shown, see the extension on the rear here. If we're just increasing the, uh, the depth of the rack, keeping the casters in the same position, it creates a problem with entry and exit angles, uh, general handling, uh, inclines, declines. So to get around that, we've added a draft onto the rear of the extension, um, and that would just allow allow you to handle the rack as you would any other rack. You know, obviously it's again six inches deeper. However, th there should be no change in in the way that you handle the product. I'll just pass over to Glenn now. Hello, everyone. I'm going to get into the details around the bus bar. So we we talked a little bit about how. HPR is being driving to higher power capabilities, and one of the big drivers in, in terms of needing additional depth was the bus bar. So in order to make the HPR compatible with the current gear we ship, we were kept the width of the bus bar the same as the current ORV3. However, we increased the depth by 125 millimeters, which had a pretty big impact on weight. So that 65 kilograms is one of the big reasons why on the previous slide, we talked about needing ballast to make the rack stable. And what we did to get to the 92 kilowatts is you can see in the smaller picture there of the standard RV3 bus bar, there's a lot of empty space in the rear area there. So what we did is we made the plates bigger for the power and return, and then we extended it to add a significant amount of copper to bring up the current carrying capacity. Uh, we also, because of additional weight, had to strengthen the interfaces between the bus bar and the frame. So we added additional attachment points as well as stiffeners to make sure that it's, it, it survives uh, the various handling and being, being robust in terms of location. We also are going to talk about this a little bit later. Uh, we improved the grounding scheme as well. So you can see in the left pictures there the, the additional, if you were to take an, a standard RV3 frame and look at it, we have additional fasteners and stiffeners. So in order to develop that cross-section design for the bus bar and determine how much copper we needed, we did a bunch of simulations. And this only shows four of them, but we did dozens of them as we were developing different layouts. And we didn't want to develop it to a particular point, but we at least wanted to understand uh, what we could support. So I'll go through these at, at a high level here, the four different main uh, layouts that we looked at. And uh, as you can tell by the first configuration, the 92 kilowatts is really what drove the rating for the, the new HPR rack. So in that layout, we have all the power and BBU at the top of the rack. And then the load is all the way at the bottom, split evenly among 16 one OU locations. And we got the 92 kilowatt rating for that. The next one's like a best case scenario. You have your power and your BBU very close to your gear. And we're able to support 140 kilowatts with that layout. And then more of a mid, where you have the IT gear kind of in the middle, uh, we're able to support 140 in that. And the way these loads were de determined is by temporized. So we didn't arbitrarily pick 5.7 and 11.7. It was based on the simulation. So that's how we were coming. We came up to these numbers, just to, to clarify. And then the last one was just a plethora of gear with different power ratings. And we, in that last one, we were able to do 128 kilowatts. So as we went to HPR, we had to improve the grounding scheme. Um, we needed alternative grounding current pass because we could potentially cause current overratings uh, of the IT gear connector at the ground contacts and power return pins, uh, leading to potential overheating. 
So we developed a, a grounding scheme to help mitigate this concern. So this diagram shows the current grounding scheme of RV3 as it is today. And I'm going to walk it through the different things that we did to, to help improve the grounding scheme. So the first thing we did is we connected the 50 volt return to the bus bar sheet metal cage uh, through some metal ground blocks at the top and bottom. And this view's kind of got the rack turned on its side and the bus bars towards the bottom. So you can kind of see those little green connections. Those are the, represent the, the ground blocks that we created. And then we also, on the, on the, on, if you were looking at that cross section of the bus bar earlier, we had some ground blocks at the front. So when the connectors, IT gear connector touches the cage, it created a ground path. So what we did is we changed that from aluminum to low conductivity metal to increase the contact resistance and, and, and basically manage the ground path. There we go. Um, and based on the needs for HPR and these new grounding requirements, we developed a new SKU for a connector that does not have a ground bracket and it's supposed to be used for IT gear with non-isolated 50 volt inputs, basically high voltage that we just went over. And, and item B there is the existing connector. And uh, lastly, the ground bonding of the PDB and motherboard in non-isolated IT gear is need to be designed to carry the full fault current when uh, 50 volt short is happen it occurs within the chassis. So that's one also additional requirement. Um, so we talked about bus bars and how we added a lot of copper there. Well, somehow we'd have to get all that power from the power source into the rack. So we had to do quite a bit of work in developing new uh, power whips. So I'll kind of walk through some of the key things here. So for the North America market, we went from a uh, L2220 to an L2230. Uh, the EU whip remained in the same design. And we'll get to the way we solved that is, is we actually doubled the number of whips going to a power shelf so not have to test the EU version. Um, and then the AC input connector, we made a keying feature. So if you look in the upper right, the keying features on the different contact connections are pointing up. And then for the high, high, high voltage version, we had them pointing down. So you, you, you can't put the wrong whip into the wrong shelf. Uh, and then um, we had to change the power cord. We had to increase the gauge to handle all the ad additional current. So we went from a 12 gauge to an eight gauge, which went from an 18 millimeter diameter bundle to a 27 uh, to comply with UL817. And uh, the, again, the power cord for the EU remains the same. But when you go that thick, you start dealing with bend radius challenges. And at the back of the chassis, where these are going to be sitting in that blue frame area, you want to still minimize the, the effect on the, the bend radiuses so that you can get things like rear, rear access screws like fans and modules. So we developed this overmold solution where we were able to maintain a relatively tight bend radius and uh, still have it be uh, reliable. And all of these very large whips are now routed outside in the blue fr frame area, as mentioned before. So now I'm going to walk through in a bit more detail the updates we made to the power shelf for HPR. So we went from an 18 kilowatt shelf to a 33 kilowatt shelf. And the way that we did that is the same number of power supply modules. Uh, however, we, we increased the ratings on each of them from three to five and a half. Um, and we also had the, because of power density, in terms of where we're at, we had to go up to 640 millimeters for the power supply modules themselves. However, that, that outer sheet metal you see there still st remained at 787 millimeters, so we didn't have to touch that. The output connector, which is in the rear there in that picture, we went up to 700 amps. And we also added a, a temperature monitoring thermistor within the design to keep an eye on that. And the peak power ratings, um, you can see, I'm not going to go through all the details there, but you can see how they've been updated. And then in terms of the actual whip connections to the power shelf, we went from 220 amp L20s to 230 amp um, L2230s. And then the reason why we're able to not have to make any changes for the EU market is because we basically doubled the number of connections and the requirements are a bit different between EU and, and, North, and North America. Uh, and some additional enhancements are we added AC loss and pulse management signal cable connections. We removed the three volt um, gap between the power supply and BBU output voltages. 
and then we added a power monitoring module called the PMM to monitor system status and connect to upstream rack mon management devices. And on the, you're going to see the same theme here because they're tied together with the BBU. Uh, the, the BBU modules themselves also went up to five and a half kilowatts. The length of the BBU modules themselves rose to 702. And just like the power shelf, we didn't have to touch the fundamental chassis design, so we stayed at 787. And we also went to a 700 amp output connector. We, uh, these are some adjustments there on backup time and peak power that are listed there. And then lastly, those three, basically three enhancements there in the power shelf are also included in the BBU in terms of AC loss, the three voltage, three volt gap, and the PMM. So how do you get involved? Well, for reference, we have all the, the specs listed on the Rack and Power Wiki. Uh, and there's a link there here and also the QR code for you to get more information. And once a month, on the second Wednesday of, of each month, Steve here hosts the Rack and Power Call. And the, HP, the HPR team gives periodic updates as we have key information to give. And so you can also find out more in those, those calls. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Yes. So you have additional depth in the frame now, so you can go to a deeper manifold. So I, I'm part of the, the blind mate man, the blind mate liquid cooling team, so we're going to share a bit more detail on that later. So if you have questions after that, come grab me as well. I can, okay? Yes. Not, we, we got to figure that out. We don't know. It's, it's things we're discussing now, but that's a very good question. I don't have an answer for that. And if David was here, he might go through detail, our power engineer, in a lot more detail. But that's being part of investigation for future stuff as well. But yes, that's on the horizon. Good question. Yep. Uh, that's a potential option. Um, We'd like to try to avoid that to allow for serviceability because that's kind of going backwards to the way V2 was, right? But uh, we'll, we'll see. At some point, you're fighting physics and, and, and contact resistance, right? So, yes, yes. You can see in the future, I can see. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Can you clarify that last part? I mean, so there's more power shells to, to get the, so we increase the capacity of the power shells and BBUs to get to 92? The rest is like, right. No, I think you can get there with the three we showed. Yeah, yep. Yes. Can you please, people, please speak up? It's kind of hard, there's a fan going on back here. That's what the reason why we added more copper. It was too, you know, obviously the current design was not enough, too, too much heat, heat rise, right? So that's how we dealt with that. Um, there's some technologies out there. We'll have to see where we end up with that. Good question. A lot of good questions. Anybody else? So I'll be around. Richard will be around. Um, feel free to come up if something comes to your mind after. Thank you.